thank you for coming to this celebration of one of the great minds and scientific advancements in the past couple centuries. That is Darwin Day. Uh, where my, my talk is going to be structured into three main parts, and the first part will, will be some general introductions to the theory of evolution and genetics, setting up the ex important experiments of uh, Kettlewell, uh, having to do with, with um, moths, and then we'll finish with uh, kind of injecting the personality of Michael Majerus and the odd conflict that came about from what is relatively settled science. And I want to talk somewhat, especially on a Darwin Day uh, presentation, about this interplay of modern culture versus science. So thank you all for coming, and we'll be talking about moths and the march of science. But I will begin first with a general introduction to evolution. And I used to, of course, teach biology at college. And one of the things that I um, uh, wanted to impart to students was just this underlying importance of evolution to how we think about all biology. Um, and one thing that I always found kind of curious in a lot of these is that a lot of times evolution is put at the back of textbook. So what I'm showing here are some uh, excerpts from a lecture textbook I used to use, Pearson. And uh, again, they have very nice illustrations of evolution, especially talking about the history of Charles Darwin, who you know, most famously went on a voyage around the world as the naturalist. This was something that was common back in the early 1800s was that you'd actually bring along a naturalist on even a military um, you know, cartography uh, expedition. And it was kind of, it was fortunate for Darwin in that it got, gave him the first opportunity as a young man to go see the world. Although it was also unfortunate because apparently he suffered from a horrible amount of seasickness. And so, um, you know, this is a map of his voyages. So you see he started in Great Britain, went around South America, and then, you know, saw a little bit of the tip of Africa, and then back to Great Britain. And South America at the time was really considered a very exotic wild land. But there were a lot of tales. There was a naturalist named Humboldt who had explored it, I think, 30 or 50 years earlier, and had written wonderful descriptions about about the nature that could be seen in, in South, South America. And so this was something that really a lot of, it really influenced a lot of naturalists in the 1800s in England of really wanting to see these amazing. Uh, what I'm also showing top right corner is the USS Beagle. And if you get the opportunity, you should um, go see a reproduction of this that is present over here in the, um, uh, on the land. Uh, something that I think was originally made by uh, nature for a nice little evolutionary exercise they used to have in Second Life. So in the course of these voyages, again, Darwin wasn't setting out to change how we think about evolution, but he was being very meticulous about taking notes and being very observant about the types of things he saw and documenting them in terms of the natural wildlife. And the most famous and classical example of this is the Darwin's finches. And so on the Galapagos Islands, there he noticed that there were a lot of what seemed to be highly related um, birds, but that seemed to have very small, important adaptations for their how they would eat. Um, now Jenny asks if the original USS Beagle sunk, and I have to admit I don't really know much about the history of Maybe someone can look it up in local chat. But... What he, what he noticed is that the, um, there seemed to be this very particular keen adaptation of each one of these finches to their own individual environment. And that uh, even though the island, and this is one important thing, is that the islands are relatively new geological formations. And so the presence of birds on the island, again, probably some small number of founding pairs that must have been blown over from the mainland, had to have been probably the original settlements that led to these other variations. And this is something that really got him thinking about the course 
of the of evolution and also how species adapt to their environment. And not, but not only did Darwin look at a lot of natural examples of species adaptations to their environments, he also took the logic of what we think of as animal domestication. And so that was something he called artificial selection, where, again, if you have anyone here a fan of dogs or anyone here a fan of, you know, cattle or goats, that these are all, these all demonstrate this um, radiation of types that we call breeds. And especially when you think about dogs, you have dogs that are highly adapted for hunting, dogs that are highly adapted for uh, sniffing out truffles, dogs that are highly adapted for hunting, dogs that are highly adapted and very intelligent for, say, sheep herding. And so, uh, now his main example he talked about in On the Origin of Species was pigeons, but I think dogs is a little bit more relatable of an example in today's world. But this, but the fact that all these different breeds exist is all due to the manipulation of their owners selecting for specific traits and saying, I want, uh, I have a dog that's really smart, and so I'm going to breed it with other dogs and keep its offspring and as compared to uh, this other dog who's not as smart, and I'm not going to keep his offspring. So that type of process was something called artificial selection and made the observation, and again, I'm summarizing a lot of evolutionary theory, is that you have variation of individuals in a population and that when you take subsets of those offspring, the ones that are surviving more often are the ones that tend to pass on those same traits onto the subsequent generations. And so um, he then applied this to call it natural selection, which is in the environment where instead of, you, instead of having a breeder select for the traits, you just have life. Right, so predation, uh, disease, all these things are the main forces that in the wild, in the natural environment, can lead to some individuals surviving over others because of the traits they inherit and then also because of the traits they pass on to the next generation. And so, you know, he, with some delay, because there was some concern about how this would be greeted by uh, society and culture at large, he did eventually publish On the Origin of Species in 1859. And just was the first to make the very clean argument that the adaptation of species to the environment is not due to um, some sort of Lamarckian evolution. It's not due to the hand of God saying, I'm going to make this animal perfect for where I'm going to put it. He said it's an interplay of the environment and also the inheritance of these traits, which he called descent with modification. Uh, one thing I'll just quickly mention is that one of the influences is uh, Malthus, who was someone proposing in terms of human populations that we would outstrip the number of people would grow geometrically, whereas the amount of food could only grow you know, arithmetically. And so eventually you get to starvation conditions. And so let me just summarize, you know, that when Darwin proposed evolution, he was saying individuals in a population vary. They produce lots of offspring. Uh, there are different selective forces that keep some around, but not others. And then over time, those variations, that diversity that's present can lead to uh, speciation. And this is, I think, most famously graphically illustrated. And you'll see this diagram from Darwin's textbooks, or textbooks that cover Darwin, this idea of the tree of life, where a branch point represents a new species developing. And again, let's just, what, in our, our modern day way of describing the generation of new species, we call that macroevolution. And I want to introduce this topic now because a lot of the talk we're is going to focus on something that's now termed microevolution, shuffling of genes within a population, not the generation of new species. But the important thing to keep in mind is that these are related phenomena that help us understand how evolution occurs. So, um, that basic introduction to Darwin, that kind of brings us up to date to the 1800s. The other concept, something that a lot of people get as kind of a, in some ways, a math exercise in biology classes, 
is, is Mendel. And the idea that uh, how does inheritance work? And that's the important thing is that to realize about Darwin, he had no understanding or science to describe how inherited characteristics got passed from one generation to the next. And in fact, in his writings, he had a very, as we would now think of it, a very kind of misguided view of how uh, inheritance worked. But Mendel, a contemporary, uh, was working on peas. Now, again, one thing to keep in mind, he was a monk. He was not necessarily integrated into the larger scientific community. But he had a very keen mind and a very good sense of math where his key observation, and I just, there's a lot of words on here, and you don't have to worry about those. The key observation is that when you, st you can have these different pea plants that always have the same characteristic from generation to generation, as long as you breed it to itself. And so this term true breeding parents is the idea that you have purple flowers. If you're always uh, pollinating the plant with itself, you're always getting purple flowers as a re result in offspring. And this was also true of the white flowers. White flowers always begat more white flowers. Now what he did was he crossed the purple to the white and noticed that the white disappeared, that all the plants were purple. However, when he took that generation and crossed it to itself, that the F2 generation, the next generation, one-fourth, again, were white. And so one of the, um, the, the key lesson here is that the inheritance of genes and how they display a phenotype in an organism are actually discrete characteristics. So the reason why this is important to understand compared to what Darwin thought about evolution is that a lot of people thought traits got blended together. And that, you know, if you, the expectation in that case would be that purple flower breeding with a white flower, you would have a light purple or lavender flower. And that all the resultant um, next generation would also be that same light purple color as a sort of blending. And so kind of like, you know, mixing Crayola crayons together. And the fact that they're discrete is something that is, uh, was contrary to what people thought at the time. Uh, you can think of this exercise as something that is like flipping a coin. And that is, if you were to flip two separate coins, what distribution would you have of having two heads, a heads and a tails, and two tails? And I think this math is very straightforward and easy that if you're flipping a coin, you have a half probability of heads, half probability of tails, and then you just combine that with the other coin flip that's half and half of heads and tails, and so one-fourth of the time it's both heads, one-fourth of the time it's both tails, and half the time, or two times one-fourth of the time, it's one heads, one tails. So again, don't worry, this is, this is some math, but I'm just introducing the basic concepts of it. But this is important for, for kind of understanding the process of science, get to the model. Uh, one thing that um, we then also observed is that this population, this, this um, generation of white flowers through multiple generations, that Mendel applied this mathematics to understanding that the inheritance of traits from of offspring to, or of a parent to offspring, had to do with this 50 50 coin flip chance. And that is, you have two copies of a gene that tell the plant to have be this color. And that half the time that gets passed on is one of the two copies, and the other time that gets passed on as the other. So this is denoted as capital P, lowercase p, to represent purple versus white. But the, the important thing is you're taking two copies of genetic information, and this is the term diploid, and that as you pass on your gametes to the next generation, it's splitting that, that content in half every time, and then reconstituting the diploid, the double copy of genomics, of genetic information that next generation. So again, this is an important concept that Mendel uh, presented to the world, although it's the realization of how important it was later was not, you know, until much later. Okay, and then the last one is the developments of science in which we now start applying a little bit more math to this concept of not just thinking about one parent, or well, one, one parent, mating with another parent and having offspring, but to actually think about this in terms of the most important unit of evolution, which is the, a population, a whole, a whole group of individuals. 
And in this particular case, the, um, the example we use is talking about flowers. And so flowers can be red or white. And we're representing uh, red as being a capital R and that the white is represented as a capital W. And the thing to keep in mind is that if you have a whole field of flowers, and for whatever reason, the, the population, uh, it's not 50-50 for white versus red, it's say 80% of the genes floating around are red, and 20% of the genes floating around are white. And so this is just a way of thinking about the math as applied to a population, not in terms of these Punnett squares, these individual crosses that you probably had in school. Um, and so the example here is that now if you think about this, just the random coming together, the random you know, flipping of heads and tails of a coin as being 80% versus 20%, then the representation of red, uh, in this case pink, a blending characteristic, as well as white, would be represented by these different proportions. So instead of being one-fourth of the different characteristics each, you have 64%, in other words, you know, 80% times 80% is 64% being the red flowers, and then 20% times 20% equaling 4% for the white flowers, and then the rest being uh, the mixture of one red with one white. Now again, it's a little bit easier to see when you have a, when you have a phenotype where the half, where being half red in terms of gene copy is pink, but that, that helps illustrate the point in this case. And so this idea of how do we use this type of statistical power to understand evolution? And the idea here is this Hardy-Weinberg concept, where if you have a large population of some individuals and some alleles in, a, in, in some sort of species, that from one generation to the next, things shouldn't change. That just large populations, you're just shuffling alleles around, it's all random chance, and boom, things don't change. And that is something you should be able to observe from generation to generation that things don't change. And this is an indication that the tenets of Hardy-Weinberg are true, and that one of the tenets of this is that evolution, there's no selective pressure for red being better than white or pink being you know, worse than the other two. And so the concept is if you see a break from that pattern, if you see things change, then that's an argument that evolution must be occurring. And so here's an example where if in one generation, you have 70% of the alleles in the population being red, again, which is something you can count by just looking at the, the actual colors of the flowers. And then the next generation, you notice that the frequency of red goes down to 50%, which again, you can count by just looking at the flowers, then that, that's an indication that perhaps red is bad for the flowers, or perhaps that white is good. Again, you could think of this, and Valentine's Day is coming up, so this is a nice little kind of analogy, that if you were, if a bunch of guys were going out to the wild fields to pick flowers for their girlfriends for Valentine's Day, and red is the in vogue color for Valentine's Day in that culture, then if they pick a bunch of the red ones before they have a chance to pollinate, to send out seed, then the next generation, that field will have a lot fewer red flowers, just because all the red ones were taken away. And that would be an indication that something is better than something else. This can also work the other way. You know, if you have a very fast movement to where all the flowers are becoming red, that might be an indication that red is a really good trait and favorable for, for breeding. Or it might mean that um, white, pink are particularly, are particularly bad. And yes, I have to agree with, uh, with Tuya that having a heart is good and being heartless is bad. So again, just a reminder that Valentine's Day is coming up as well. Okay, so just as a representation of the math, the idea here is that there's this Hardy-Weinberg equation that we then use to understand uh, whether evolution is occurring in population. And it's actually relatively straightforward math. This is, uh, you know, if you're familiar with exponents, you've probably seen this type of thing uh, already in, you know, simple algebra. Uh, and just a reminder that the power of this is that if you have a population where you can see the phenotypes, then, and you can then count up what percentage these are of a population, you can go back and actually figure out those allele frequencies, right? So this is actually understanding the genes by looking at the population, and they can look at this over time. 
Okay, so the setup here for what is, uh, again, talking about the next part, oh, is, yeah, let me summarize, I'm gonna slow down here, that the, the setup here is that there were three threads that were occurring by the mid 1900s. And that first of all, you had Darwin with his publication of On the Origin of Species. You had, uh, again, a co-publishing author, uh, Alfred Wallace, who um, had subsequent follow-up publications that talked a lot about biogeography, but also had the same idea of natural selection and variation in populations that occur due, uh, due to evolution. Uh, Mendel's work, again, originally published in 1866, but because he wasn't engaged in the community, he actually, he actually was told to stop doing his experiments with peas in the monastery. It wasn't until the early 1900s that his work was actually rediscovered, and then brought back into uh, the scientific community. And then Hardy Weinberg, uh, again, also independently working from each other, that's actually two separate people, where they published their work on this concept of applying math uh, to how selective processes work. Although it really wasn't until the 1920s where the work of Haldane, Fisher, and Sewell Wright really brought in this concept of using the math to look at natural populations and to understand how evolution could be occurring. And this is something that, uh, again, they could go out and look at populations to see what sort of selective pressures you can imagine are changing the allele frequencies in a population and get a measurement of, of evolution. Now, the setup here, and this is the important um, you know, contribution that Kettlewell makes uh, based on the work of his advisor, E.B. Ford, that no one actually experimentally has demonstrated evolution in action yet. And I think this is the important contribution we want to understand from Kettlewell and how we can look at, at um, evolution, microevolution in a sense, is that this actually requires a lot of experimental work. And so let's talk about moths. So Bistan betularia, it's also just commonly known as the British peppered moth. And it's typica, it's type um, presentation. And again, you might have to look very closely at the screen to actually see the moth on top of the lichen, is that it's just got this very peppery, white, powdery look, which helps it blend in very nicely to the tree trunks uh, that have lichen on them. And so, uh, Again, what's the purpose for having this? This is your standard concept that, again, you have from, you know, uh, people like Bates and um, I'm blank on the other guy, of camouflage, right? Camouflage is a survival advantage. If your predators can't see you, then they can't eat you, and you can pass on your genes to the next generation. Now, what was observed uh, the, for the first time in 1848, so again, you know, the beginning or, you know, sometime after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution is the Carbonia morph of this moth. And again, you look at it and it's just black. Uh, and when you think about this concept of wanting to blend into your environment, that this is really not good, that this is something that if you were a bird, or if you were some sort of predator who could you know, observe this difference, you'd say, wow, that's an easy snack, that was easy to find. Now, of course, I'm mentioning the Industrial Revolution because what is the, the advantage of being black is that on certain tree trunks, you actually blend in better because of all, one, you've basically put a lot of pollution onto onto the tree itself, some ash, but then also you, you're killing off the lichen due to the pollution, and so you know, you're missing out on this nice white background. So in fact, there is some sort of survival advantage to being, to being black. And this general concept is something known as industrial melanism. So this existence of this you know, binary look of moths at the same time that the environment is changing due to a very fast uh, change in the environment due to pollution and also a very strong selective pressure in theory. And so this is the setup for uh, Henry Bernard Davis Kettlewell. Uh, again, shown here uh, from, again, some 
some photographs derived from uh, Oxford, which is where he, ended, where he ended up doing this work, showing him both in his uh, natural environment and being around moths. Again, one thing to keep in mind that I'm going to mention now because otherwise I'll forget it. It's not the amount of work that went into his experiments involved meticulously and carefully capturing and breeding and raising moths in a laboratory. And we're talking probably thousands of moths over a decade of time in order to make sure that he had enough of a, of a population. Now, in modern day biology, and this is something I love about modern day biology, you could probably order these from a catalog uh, these days in order to do this experiment. There's so many things that we can just do now. So it's important to appreciate that uh, not only did they not have color back in those days, but they also had to basically raise and deal with a lot of their own material themselves. So a little, a little bit of biography on Kettlewell. And uh, again, I don't, we're not going through all the particulars here, but I do want to point out that his background and his training was as a, as a zoologist, but in the context of a medical profession. And so he actually technically was a medical doctor and actually served on location in different hospitals for the, um, you know, the British uh, armed services. And so, again, he, de he did that work, you know, involved being primarily involved in understanding insects and the interplay of insects with, you know, troops and diseases related to those. But that it wasn't until later where he actually came into the more scientific academic environment at Oxford University. And again, he was brought in as someone by E.B. Ford, who um, was, again, one of the founders of the... Um, the field of population ecology and trying to use these Hardy-Weinberg equations to really understand how that was working. So, but as an academic researcher, he was incredibly prolific during the 1950s at putting out this research where he, um, you know, both did some small Field try, fall, small field experiments, which I'll describe, about how moths are evolving and how they're responding to uh, these changed environments and how predation is changing the alleles in the population. Uh, so, again, publishing both in academic, envir in, in academic journals, and then eventually I think the, the thing that really got his work into you know, more well-known um, uh, knowledge across the culture is in Time Science Review in 1956, as well as Scientific American, Darwin's Missing Evidence. Again, things that we could probably look up now, I would recommend you look up now and take a look and read. So I'm going to describe in brief the work that he did and its impact, and then, um, but this is relatively straightforward, let me say. And the, uh, the concept here is that within a small enclosure, what he could do was uh, score moths on trees and then actually just sit and observe how often birds within that same enclosure end up um, eating them. And so uh, this is some of the first publications where uh, published in Heredity demonstrating that, you know, by observation it looks like the birds are more often uh, eating the ones that are a little bit more visible. Uh, again, some criticisms of this is that some of the, in some of the cases, the experiments actually just used dead moths, right? These weren't live moths. These were just moths that were, were pinned and then observing how often they're pretty, or how often the ones targeted. Uh, the other thing too is that these were, you know, placed and put up on trees by the scientists. So again, this is one of these concepts that's important to recognize in science is that to some degree you might call it a, a biological uncertainty principle which is the more clean you make an experiment in terms of reducing variables from it, the more you can be criticized for it not being a natural environment, right? And this is one of these give and takes that is important in science for understanding how to generate clean experimental results. And that also is a cautionary tale to not necessarily overinterpret those, but they are parts of developing the theory of how things work, and that's science. Uh, the other thing he also would do was go place moths on trees within an environment and then just go back and count them, right? So again, this is experiments that in some cases were used with not even live moths. Uh, these are things where the scoring in, 
and the experimental conditions are not necessarily the most natural. But again, trying to make that next step of not having it in an enclosed space where you've also brought in, you know, predator birds, but in fact, again, going back to, to more natural environment. Now, the, um, the next step was to, oh, sorry, and then, the, well, the nice thing, though, about that particular environment, about, about that particular experiment was that he could place moths both of both types on both the natural trees and also the ones that are polluted. So you can get a sense of how to score these either way. Now, the setup here is that what he can, what the next step of experiments was to do what were called release and recapture. And the idea here is that he would take hundreds of moths and go out to the natural environment and release the moths into the wild, let them settle in, on trees, do what, do, you know, let them go and do what they naturally do, find their resting spots, and then come back and try and recapture all of his moths and then count up how many survive from the two different types. The, um, the exciting, so I'm showing actual data from the paper, but you can just focus on the, um, the arrows at the bottom. One thing to keep in mind that this environment, the Birmingham recaptures were done in a polluted environment. So Birmingham being an industrial center had a lot of um, trees that were you know, highly dark. And so this observed versus expected, this is math, this is numbers, but the main idea here is that on the left, the column that has the C on it, he observed 140 moths that were present, that were carbonoia, when he basically recaptured them from what he'd released. And that that number was much higher than the expected. So again, he knew the, the carbonia versus typica percentages that he released, and of the ones that he recaptured, he could make this count. And he actually observed much, many more coming back that were fitting the environment as compared to the ones that don't fit the environment. And that's what you see in the columns that are labeled T for typica morph, that he observed and recaptured many fewer of the typica than he expected based on how many he had released. And when he performed basically the, the, the converse experiments, and this is in dead end, where the trees were typically a more natural environment, that there were many fewer of the carbononia that were recaptured, again, looking at the blue area, blue arrows versus what he expected, versus the typica that were red, or sorry, that are, I'm indicating by the red, air, red arrows, and that many more of those came back than expected. So again, the idea that over the course of a few days, the predation was much, uh, was very effective on the type of more, uh, on the type of moth that was not as easily blended into that particular environment. And then finally, his follow-up work was to really look at the overall distribution of the different types of moths and track this in a biogeography type of way compared to the areas that were more or less polluted. And so again, this is, uh, you know, Kettlewell, I think, should be applauded for the amount of work and the amount of time he put into trying to, in multiple ways, build a story build an explanation of how evolution works, and he was celebrated in his time for being this evidence of evolution in action. Now, I want to remind you that he was doing work by himself in the 1950s with probably the best available thing that, that he could work with. Um, and that'll be an important part of the story. But I want to pause here and see, does anybody have any questions about, you know, this basic concept of how to experimentally prove that evolution is something that occurs. Now is the time. And I'm sorry, this, this does seem a little bit esoteric and dry, uh, but we'll get a little bit, a little bit spiced up with some controversy in a moment. I have a question from Jenny. And while, while she's typing that, I just want to point out that, again, there was a lot of theoretical work that involved explanations of how evolution works. But science, the march of progress in science, is to actually, as best as you can, experimentally demonstrate that these predictions you have, based on a theory, actually fit the observations you have when you have these things actually going on. And that's what the science at this time, and this was the first 
you know, in action evolution demonstration that was presented. All right. Um, Yeah, so Jenny asks, the problem I see is, as you already pointed out, how you would conduct experiments on the moths or any other predated species. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, this is something to point out. I'll just let me philosophically talk a little bit about science that, you know, science is not fact. Science is an attempt to create an explanation of the world for how it works. And you don't have to have a true absolute thing occur to help you generate those ideas and those explanations. They just have to be consistent, predictable, and useful in many ways. And so I think, you know, the idea that predation in a small enclosure fits the model is a part of saying that this is a good explanation. But we're not necessarily saying it's absolutely. And so I've actually, this is actually a good setup um, yeah, and that's one thing about the interpretation of science is that as long as you do science the right way, what you're ultimately usually doing is putting forth claims for what it means for how to describe the universe at large. And there is this, I mean, the scientists understand this as a limitation for how science works. And in fact, this is a good setup. This is a very good question, and I think you'll get more answers from this as I talk about the rest of the talk. The third part is to talk about Michael Majerus. And so, Mike Majerus, again, this is, there's a flowering of people who worked in looking at evolution, particularly in this like population, industrial melanism side, so much to the point that uh, Mike Majerus, a professor at Cambridge, basically wrote a whole book called Melanism, right? And this is something that probably not one you saw on the New York Times bestseller list, but something that within the academic field, an update to understanding uh, this very important aspect of evolution in action. Uh, he himself was actually a scientist who worked on uh, ladybirds, which we call also ladybugs in the uh, US, across the pond. Now, what he was doing as a scientist in this book was trying to update work from multiple examples of industrial melanism in insects, but then also point out that, you know, if you experimentally look at what Kettlewell did, there are issues with how we would do that experiment today. And some of the things he pointed out, he, some of the, the things that are important to question, is bird vision the same as human vision? That Again, the aspect of predation of this black versus white moth, do birds even see that, right? Birds might have some ability to detect moths on that camouflage. That's actually where the camouflage is useless for them. Uh, do the high numbers of released moths change the predation, right? You actually could be changing the predators by having so much food suddenly available, or maybe just so many visual stimuli of the different types of moths. That is not a standard natural environment. Uh, Kettlewell also released, again, for experimental sakes, he released the bugs during the day because that's the easiest way to do it. Um, and so is that something that maybe had the moss a different behavior? So it's not really, again, a good, natural exper a good natural example of how that evolution actually occurs. Um, and then also just the idea of placing things on trunks, was that necessarily even where moths naturally would um, rest in terms of natural environment? So, you know, these are all things that are very important experimental considerations. That if you were to take the original experiments and say, how would I refine these and do these better? Uh, you would do that. And it's important to note that this is an important process of science where making sure you're not over-interpreting or having, you know, things that have impact the math or, the, or how the, or the experiment is conducted is an important thing to do and to keep revis revisiting. Now, the one thing that, um, that Majerus was not saying is that he thought that the concept of industrial melanism and evolution in action was wrong. Right? He was saying these are modifications to how you do the experiments where the numbers that Kettlewell was getting may not really represent the true selective pressure or maybe not, may not represent the true mechanism of how it was occurring. 
But again, he wrote a book on melanism, <laughs> not because he thought it was false, but because he wanted to have the best science being put forward. Now, can anybody here see the setup? And how, what, this, what is going to happen in modern day culture to release this type of book? Uh, and this is, this is kind of the, the response. And this is a book called Of Moths and Men, put out by Judith Hooper, uh, published in 2002, where she takes up on these criticisms that was primarily put forth by Majerus, and basically creates this as a huge talking point for anti-evolutionists. Uh, and here's a quote I took from it. Uh, Majerus's book left no doubt that the classic story was wrong in almost every detail. And again, if you read the book, uh, which again, it's actually kind of an interesting book. It does cover a good amount of science, but I, I do want to caution you to be careful about some of the details that she's trying to put forward, although I think it does, it's a nicely readable background, the history of the study. Um, and, you know, what, and I'll, well, I'll talk more about this later, but, you know, the oddball history of me with this book was that I was teaching biology at University of New Orleans, and a book publisher, a textbook publisher, came by and said, hey, here are some books that we have. And I was like, oh, I'm not interested in any new textbook. But then she says, hey, we have all these, like, you know, not textbooks, but just regular paperback books that you might have students read and be discussion points. And so, you know, I, in terms of just looking at this, I thought, oh, this is awesome. This is something I've always wanted to learn about in a nicely readable format, and I think my students would enjoy it. And as I was reading it, I was starting to get questions of, what is this book actually about? And when I looked up the reviews of the book, realized that in many ways, again, and I don't want to necessarily impugn the intentions of the author, but that it's certainly something that, that clearly is more of a hit piece on the scientists doing the work. And so uh, I, I find it very interesting that, you know, book publishers are helping, you know, promote something that is ultimately being used uh, by, you know, anti-evolutionists to argue. Okay, so um, in addition to giving a little bit of a background to the science, she actually is try she puts forth a lot of, she tries to imply a lot of reasons why Ford and Kettlewell might have just been fraudulent. And that, uh, you know, there were pressures in publishing academic science, there was a lot of people who were looking at this. So even before you publish, a lot of other scientists know the work that's going on. And so then the, the, the pressure to get it out there can be pretty immense. Uh, and the one thing that also just drove me crazy in reading through the book is that she actually even invokes Thomas Kuhn, who wrote On the Structure of Scientific Revolu Revolutions, which is, you know, a very important major piece in how we understand the process of science, that, you know, oh, these people are trying to publish fraudulent work because they don't want to let go of the way they think things work. Uh, and so, of course, they're trying to push this moth story, even though they know it's wrong and not working out. And I really have issues with people trying to use Kuhn in that context. And that's what I was pointing, trying to, yeah, as I've pointed out multiple times, this is science, and this is how science works. And if you are a non-scientist trying to look and read this and skim the concepts behind Thomas Kuhn, you can easily misinterpret what that is really trying to do with so I'm just going to show a couple of examples that in the Kettlewell Revisited that the you know, anti-evolutionist you know, populace picked up on this and said, hey, uh, this whole peppered moth example is a fraud. It's a flaming fraud. It's actually amazing how scientists are trying to put one over on us. And then, you know, at the same time where they point out that there are, you know, first of all, they extend the argument of saying, well, there's some questions of fraud to actually saying, oh, it is fraud. And that once you start questioning what the scientists are doing, then it really makes you think that, you know, there's nothing that makes evolution true. And that if the moth example is gone, there's just no examples of evolution having been shown to be true. And that's just someone who's sitting from a perch of ignorance, not really sitting down and trying to make sure they are being proper to the context, that there's a lot of other stuff that's been done since 1956 to understand how evolution works, and in particular, multiple, multiple examples, these types of industrial melanism, just as one example alone. Uh, again, anybody want to just pop out any other examples of evolution and action that is relevant, that is also pertinent to the common man?
Again, something where human culture and science is changing the environment, and then organisms are clearly responding in. No? no antibiotic resistance, anyone? Bacteria being antibiotic resistance? Or how about uh, resistance to herbicides that we find in the cornfields? Or how about resistance to pesticides that we find in insects that are uh, also trying to eat our crops, right? These are, you know, multiple great examples of other things that are occurring. Urban rat populations, that's a good one. Oh, another good one is also, um, thank you to you. Uh, also, you know, fish populations. As we, as people fish, they tend to keep the larger ones and throw back the smaller ones. And one thing that effect that has had is that the average breeding age of fish and average breeding size of fish is actually smaller. So these things are all lots of examples that have occurred since the 1950s, but that was the start of trying to understand. Here's another example for another web page where, again, that, you know, they're trying to, in a short point, point out some of the very reasonable flaws, but to act as if that completely undermines the entirety of science. That if you do have this artificial situation of putting dead moss on trees for the birds to feed on, or that they may or may not necessarily go on trunks, that it means science must be wrong. And again, this is going back to the idea that in science, you do try and work on experimental conditions. Then you follow it up with better and better experiments like Kettlewell did. And yeah, I think Jenny, you know, she, she makes a comment, and I think this is a good one. Thank you for contributing. Personal attacks are making me suspicious about people trying to convince me of anything. And this is one of these rhetorical tricks, which I'll talk about in a second, of, you know, if you disagree with someone, it can sound very convincing to impugn the person. And then, if, but at the same time, if you're completely ignoring the topic of what it is, you know, what the argument is about, then you're really not refuting what they said. And that's one thing that is, I think, a very important criticism about the Judith Hooper uh, book of Moss and Men. While she implied lots of examples of fraud, there actually are ways to scientifically validate whether fraud occurred. Right? You can actually go back, look through notebooks. You can actually do the math yourself. If your attempts to replicate the experiments don't give you the same results, then that's, those are evidence potentially of fraud. Uh, but that was never found. She just implied the possibility of fraud by saying, well, there's a reason for them to commit fraud, but not actually do it. And I think this is important. You know, this is an example in modern day culture where, you know, climatologists are attacked for having a job and a profession where they derive a salary and money from being climatologists. And that must mean, oh, their science is wrong or they're faking it. Like, you know, you don't even address the actual science itself. So anyway, I have uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, just a few things. And I want to just summarize this. That when you think about the bad faith rhetoric that you have um, in these types of scientific versus the non-science people trying to attack the science, that, you know, this, this is an example of the nitpicking, where if you say, oh, this one example is wrong, then everything must be wrong. Well, that's ignoring how science works. Science is always about a body of evidence. Uh, ignoring the independent evidence, right? The human genome was published by this time for Pete's sake. Right? You can't tell me science hasn't moved on from trying to release and recapture moths. Uh, we actually have so many more things that, that science has told us about how evolution works in very particular detail. And so again, I've given talks before and I'll recommend it again. If you want to have a nice introduction to an update on evolution, what Darwin never knew. Uh, it's a, a documentary put out by NOVA, by you know, PBS, and just a great summary of how we know a whole lot more than what Darwin ever did, based on the march of science. Uh, and then third, as I've mentioned, imputing the motives of scientists without really addressing the science itself. Now, and this is where I do want to point out that science does is influenced by the personalities of the scientists who do it. We cannot take that out of the equation to say that scientists are people and that there are egos, there are mistakes, all these things that can occur in terms of the science. And so this is where the final part of the story is, I think, a very poignant one, that Majerus himself actually felt very guilty that his book was used to impugn Kettlewell. 
and that he had made a bunch of criticisms about the work. And I'm summarizing these here, and I don't want to go, we're getting a little short on time, so I don't want to go through them too much. I want to leave time for questions. But if you look at this, he's like, well, maybe I can do the experiment better, right? And so this is some work that he presented in uh, 2007 to an evolutionary biology conference, where over time, he said, you know, I'm going to do the kettle wool experiment, and the criticisms I made, I will address those. And I want to point out to a reminder, this is science, right? You can criticize someone and then say, hey, let's just go back and revisit it and try again. And so some of the things, basically what he did was he let moths naturally, he recorded moths in the natural environment. He recorded them over a long period of time, over several years, and did his best to address these different questions. And so, again, trying to largely avoid lab-bred um, trying to do stuff in the wild environment, uh, letting them go to the natural resting places, etc. Uh, again, and other improvements. Uh, again, now again, the limitation here is that he didn't like Kettlewell go throughout the entire area of Britain to look for this. He basically had to limit himself to uh, his home where he was living, and um, you know, other limitation is that he couldn't do the polluted environments. Is that by this time Cambridge and this area was relatively cleaned up. So they could only do the one-sided experiment. Uh, and try to, as much as possible, directly observe what actually did or did not happen. Now, one of the criticisms that people had was saying, oh, Petowell was putting moths on trunks, and we don't even know if moths go on trunks by themselves, naturally. So one thing he did do as a part of this analysis was to observe that without his, his placing anything anywhere, is that, you know, almost a third of the population, or more than a third of the population, of moths just would naturally go and land on trunks. That, in fact, a natural resting place was trunks. So stop criticizing Kittlewell for putting stuff on trunks, is what he did. Now, the results of his work, and this is kind of the, the interesting part, he ultimately did not publish this in a scientific journal himself. He died. And I don't know the nature of his illness, but he died suddenly while this was something that was being worked on and, and being submitted for publication. And so actually a bunch of his colleagues made sure it got written up, submitted to science and reviewed, and shepherded it through that. Uh, and that gets one thing to re remind us that, you know, science is this important process of publishing your results. And what we're showing, and this is the key figure from the paper, and the comparison is the typical morph, which is represented by blue, versus the carbonia, carbonia morph, which is represented in red. And this is the percent that survived in these different time periods of observation. And so the fact that the blue line always has a higher survival rate, again, in this environment that favors their camouflage, uh, you know, over multiple years, and statistically analyzed that this is statistically significant, demonstrated that Again, in terms of an improved experimental protocol, the same results were seen. And so uh, this was, again, the last, the last experiments of Michael Majerus. Again, something that he was prompted to do, I don't think necessarily because he thought it was scientifically the most important thing to do, but in many ways, as a hero of evolution, someone who said he needed to address something that he felt in many ways guilty about because of the pollution of the conversation about whether the moth story was true or not. And so, again, this is another diagram of, of some of the work from Mike Majerus that he presented. And I want to conclude here by thanking you all for coming to explain the, um, uh, you know, this Darwin Day and that, there, that Darwin and the march of science and how we understand evolution is this combination of the process of science and the scientists who are behind it. And I think Jenny saying she could explain the high of 2006, that if you look at this chart, in one year it seems like the carbononia morph is equivalent that particular season. And I don't know, was there a lot of pollution or something that year? I'm not aware of the specifics of that particular year. But otherwise, uh, as she puts maybe that forth in, in local chat, I'll stop here and take any questions. Anyone? Anyone?
just also maybe want to comment on the dismay one feels about the conversation that that is out there now about evolution. Oh, interesting. So Jenny is saying, 2006 was a pretty hot year with a warm, with warm winter before. So predators had a lot of other food sources. So the argument there is that they both had a the moss both had a high survival rate because, you know, there was just the strength of predation was much lower than typical. So Jan asked an interesting question. And Jan, for those of you who don't know or people watching this video, he's actually from Japan. And his question is, are, are there any states in the USA where teaching evolutionary theory is prohibited? And the answer is no. And in fact, there's a really nice, um, uh, you cannot prohibit the teaching of evolution because that would fall under you know, free speech. However, and this is one of these things to keep in mind, is that well, you, you can't make it illegal to teach evolution. What you can try and do is insert uh, things that detract from learning evolution. Uh, and actually, as I kind of mentioned before, this is one thing that I found from a, a nephew of mine who was living in Georgia, that they would put evolution at the end of the semester, and that sometimes the teacher wouldn't even get to it. Right? They talk about cell theory and everything, but not actually get to evolution. Um, that's harder to do in a, in a world where science standards are becoming much more typical, that these are the expectations of what you teach, and that within the academic school environment, at least in the public schools, you have this basic requirement to teach evolution. So you can't outlaw it, it's required to be, be taught. However, what pe people like the Design Institute, a lot of anti-creationists, or anti-evolutionists try and do to creationists, is that they will try to insert you know, creationism and evolution into the textbooks. Now, ultimately, this was, in a Supreme Court decision, found to be illegal. That's actually promoting religion to teach evolution in, in science classes. You can teach it as a cultural phenomena, but not as science. So that's actually, it is actually illegal to try and teach creationism as science. However, what they also then try and do is muddy the waters and invent things like intelligent design which is they're claiming a scientific theory, but in fact is just another branding of type of creationism. And so the, uh, the Dover case, um, I, always forget the, the, I always forget the first name of the verses, but there's a very nice documentary called Darwin, I think Darwin on Trial, also put out by, by PBS, describing that even intelligent design is something that is now considered creationism is, and thus illegal to teach in school. But people keep trying, right? And this is the thing, people keep trying to muddy and confuse, confuse the conversation. Uh, Jenny asked about Utah. I don't know anything in particular about Utah's science standards or their teaching, but uh, it's definitely not illegal to teach evolution. But that was a good question, Jan. I don't know if Japan has a slightly different situation. Well, okay, yeah. Utah is also a great place to find caffeine-free Coke. So that's the earth. So, yeah, Yosein mentions there has been an ongoing evangelistic driven battle against teaching evolution in many states that has been revitalized under the current administration. And, yeah, I, I think that's, that's important to point out. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, when it comes to the point where we're having to litigate whether creationism or science can and can't be taught, then one, let me say that, that, that that's already the beginning of a cultural failure, okay? Um, that's already the beginning. And that the courts can be, again, not necessarily the most rational when the push has been to put people who make irrational arguments and have this, again, dedication to religion as a science explanation on the Supreme Court. So yeah, there's always this push to keep doing it. So I think one thing, to keep, one thing that has been effective, you know, is that people do get upset about this, right? People will get upset and petition directly schools and teachers when they see, you know, science being mistreated. Uh, Jenny, no, I think I... Okay, so Jenny says, I wouldn't go so far to actually reject ID, intelligent design. They just have failed to prove it yet. And I think that's, that's not the right way to think about it, is that it's not a theory that has 
scientific validity because it doesn't have predictable outcomes. It's one thing. I mean, there are lots of things you can criticize. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that every intelligent design is this explanation that's in many ways just kind of a God of the gaps argument that, that you know, they say, oh, evolution doesn't explain this, and so it must have been designed. Um, that, is, that in and of itself is not a valid scientific theory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, that, and in many ways, it's again, it's, it's put out there. It's des intelligent design is designed to be a way to give highly religious people who don't, who want to believe something and want to reject the science, a kind of argument and a bit of solace for it. So I think that's an important point. Um, so, you know, two yes, it's a really interesting question. What is the relevance of natural selection theory to human society? And, boy, that's a large question to you. Is there something you want me, can you narrow it down a little bit for me? Uh, <laughs> because I think I mentioned some of the things too that is in terms of understanding, say, agriculture and that the use of pesticides leads to a situation where the pesticides don't work anymore. So we need to make sure we keep investing and in developing new ways to kill pests to make sure we keep feeding ourselves, right? That's, I think, one example that comes to mind. Or antibiotics, that we need to keep developing ways of understanding how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics so that we can keep having surgeries. There's a, a book that I did in this honors class that I taught um, where you know, the topic was microbial resistance by a guy, a, a New York doctor, and and you know he was making the the important point that if we can't fix the antibiotic resistance problem, we can't have surgery. Surgery for even minor things becomes more threatening than what you are trying to fix. So I think, you know, there are a couple examples of the relevance. Uh, Jenny wants to say the problem is far worse. And I, I will likely agree with that. So, as you put that together, Jenny, I'm going to address something that Jan said, which is, you know, society is already selecting people. And this idea, there's actually an article that just came out that I saw pushed across my, my Facebook feed of talking about human selection that we are selecting on ourselves, that the concept of the argument is that, you know, more mild-mannered men is something that helps integrate and keep society as a whole successful. And so that this, um, so as we keep, in a sense, finding, if women find those men more attractive in a certain cultural context, then the next generation of men tend to be the more mild-mannered men. And that when you think about the way society works, is that, you know, People were pretty vicious, right? When we think about torture in England in the you know dark ages, people were much more vicious. And is there something actually that in our genes, in behavior, as something that has occurred over time due to these types of internal selective pressures in society? I think that's an interesting concept. I, I'm not saying it's true because I think it's a proposal, but it's a very intriguing one. So um, George Newberry says, you know, all antimicrobials, they'll kill off, you know, 99.99% and there's always that remaining 0.01%. But that 0.01% that survives now probably has um, this genetically inheritable trait where the next time you apply that antimicrobial, 100% survive. Well, Jenny, okay, so... Um, Jenny makes a point that maybe we shouldn't talk about the Dark Ages as harshly as we do, but uh, again, I've actually, you know, watched a good amount of um, Richard Burke documentaries, and I think the case can be made pretty well that in terms of advancing human society, this period of time after the fall of the Roman Empire into about the Renaissance was clearly backwards moving in terms of um, technology, the development of technology, um, 
and, and, a, and a greater influence of religion into life than ever before. So I think you can make the argument that that's like one of the worst times of things going backwards. Um, now, there was lots of things that did occur during the Dark Ages and a lot of amazing art, but I think from a technological science point of view, uh, really until you started getting, you know, the Renaissance times, I think it's fair to say that from a, it was pretty bad. Yeah, I'm not saying there weren't. You know, the idea of, of the vacuum, the idea of understanding how um, electricity works, um, you know, the development of printing press, you know, that would, I think, fundamentally, fundamentally be considered during the Dark Ages time period. So, yeah, some inventions occurred, but as the totality of where things were going from the Romans inventing plumbing, you know, that's, I think it's a definite backwards movement. Okay. All right, so, so we're hitting 908, and again, this is Darwin Day, but it's also a work day, <laughs> and so I can't spend that much extra time doing this. Um, oh, okay, so actually, this is a thank you for coming, Akina. Uh, actually, so this is, let's finish on this, because I think George brings up this really interesting point, and that is... Humans rely much more on human invention for survival than genetics. While genetics do help, humans have derived methods to supersede genetics, or let's just say any sort of natural selection or natural processes, uh, to supersede genetics, corrective surgery, medication, therapies, etc. And I do want to point out that this idea of this more like Lamarck um, inheritance that society has now is one that helps that can help us move away from those same selective pressures. Uh, and I think that's a great point, George. But, you know, I think the important point I want to make is that, yeah, we have the technology, but if we're not sitting down and learning the lessons of the natural world, of trying to understand the interplay of human biology, especially very old programming that we still have in our brains for how things work and what we kind of do and don't want to do with our personal lives and how we integrate in society, and the types of things we invent to make, in theory, our lives better, we can be taking a lot of steps backwards with technology. And we, can't, and we may get to a point where we burden ourselves with so many problems that, you know, survival is tough, right? So industrial revolution leading to climate change, not good. Even something simple where we think, oh, wow, it'd be great if we could have a mobile phone that allows us to make calls where we want to go. But at the same time, we're learning that the impact of those on attention, our ability to interact with each other, and or the development of, of young minds spending too much time in front of these screens is bad for society. And if we don't spend the time learning and thinking ahead of time, uh, what are the best things to do? I think creating a context in which people trying to get rich off of other people's, off of disadvantaging other people's development, you know, Technology is not necessarily better than genetics. You know, it's, we have to be caught. We, I think we have to take a right, a good path forward. Try and make sure we keep track of the boat. I think that's a great point that, you know, there's a point at which technology helps us. We don't have to worry about surviving because we have good genes. We survive because we work as a community that can solve problems. Yes, Chantel, thank you. Thank you all for coming and, and sticking through. I know some of it was dry at the beginning, but I think it's important to talk about how evolution works and to set up the actual science, the contributions that Kettlewell, Ford, Bajeris made. And uh, one thing to note, uh, hopefully Jess can send out that note card. I actually worked with another uh, scripter to design a little exercise that teaches moth evolution. It's hosted here on the Science Circle land, but it's also present in a few other places. And if you can send that note card out at some point today, or also post it to uh, the website for this video, that would be great. And I think that's a fun little exercise people can do. Any, anyone else? Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for helping contribute to the conversation as well. All right, I am going to go ahead and put this back home.
and turn on a voice.